And I guess the first order of business will be amendments to the agenda. And we have a couple. Um, let's see. Um, could I have a motion to remove the executive session for a student matter? Item number nine. So in order, Ben, you can't do motions if you don't have a quorum. Look at that. I guess we'll come back to amendments to the agenda. Thank you. What we can do is public comment. So let's uh, see if anybody from the public here would uh, like to address the board. No public comment? Okay. All right. One on the board. Oh, thank you. Um, no, that's, I think that's your, just a, that's me. That's just, oh, okay. That's your right. <laughs> Your mouth looked like a hand raised. <laughs> Good eye, though. That was great. And we have our And we have our form. Yay! Oh, Give that man a cup treat. Like, hey, Dad. Now, <laughs> now I'll return to the amendments to the agenda. Um, Anna, did I hear you make a motion to remove right. item nine uh, from the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, I don't know if there's any discussion here. I think it's just because we don't need to talk about a student matter. Um, so all in favor of moving, moving item nine, say aye. 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 Uh, the ayes have it. There's no item nine. Uh, next, we'd like to, can I have a motion to add to the time scheduled appointments a matter? Uh, this would be a new item F which would be accept resignations and or retirements. And retiring is Tim Brennan, science teacher from the high school and uh, resigning Michael Lannon, elementary teacher at Barnum Academy. Is there a motion? So no moved. Well, Adam's motion, is there a second? Second. Josh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the scant number of ayes who voted, we have it. And so we'll add those items to the time schedule appointments. Okay, um, let's go. So we did public comment. I'll give a second chance if anybody uh, caught you by surprise. Nothing from the public? All right, thank you. Um, Superintendent's report. Yes. Um, to first to begin, um, I'm speaking about um, one of the major tasks of my role as superintendent is supervision and evaluation. Um, one of the pieces that came back from the Quaglia survey of last spring was um, teachers not seeing the benefit of the annual goal setting, which brought us to looking at our supervision and evaluation framework. It was very dated. Noreen will remember the infamous if dip. It still talked about it. Dip. So um, I've taken on rewriting the framework and I've been working with the faculty advisory council on how do we make those goal settings more impactful. And so I'll be pre presenting to the um, the leadership team, a revision to the supervision and evaluation framework. Um, another piece of work that I'm really excited about, uh, again, from the, um, the data that we reviewed last year, we met with the administrator, I mean, the school board, and we talked about how um, the increase in number of boys referrals for behavioral reasons and our concerns around performance. So myself and Dr. Sinkamani over at Prosper Valley have been interviewing fifth and sixth grade boys around their experiences joint happiness in the classroom. Um, as a result of some initial conversations, we pulled together a focus group from students from each of the five classrooms. Um, as a result of that um, and their recommendations, we are putting some new steps in place, including engaging all students in more physical activity throughout the day and elevating student voice um, as we make decisions through the building. It's been really fun work to do. Our fifth grade and sixth grade boys have a lot to say. Um, and finally, um, tonight I will pr present to you the proposed strategic point uh, plan goals and priority areas. This I missed two board meetings and my mouth isn't working. This is what happens when I miss some board meetings. Um, and to remember that uh, the way we came to this plan was through our design team, which included parents, faculty members, administrators, um, and community members. And so I will be doing a presentation of that later in the meeting. Great. Thank you, Sherry. Any questions for our superintendent? All right. Uh, our next report, please, is our. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm getting lost in the agenda. Yeah. Rap. Uh, rap. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, piece I wanted to share with you uh, tonight is actually around enrollment. Um, 
if you look at the enrollment in the board report tonight, you'll, you'll notice that um, we had an increase in enrollment of four students from our December period. Um, and what's, it, what's notable about this is that we're only two students below where we were, our enrollment was at this time last year. Um, and so this is interesting because as recently as November, our student enrollment was 17 um, less than it was a year ago. Um, so right now we're only two behind where we were. We're actually at the same enrollment as we did at the end of last year. So our enrollment appears to be stabilizing um, and we're not losing students. Um, the next piece I'd like to share is, um, so Cognia, you may have remembered from last year, us talking about Cognia and the VT CAP assessments. Um, we're ramping up um, our preparations for that again this year. The big change um, is that the agency of education has pushed the window a month earlier. So all the testing will be happening a month earlier in our schools. Um, so our principals and school leaders are trying to figure out how that works for each school. Um, but that's gonna be happening much sooner than it, than it did last year. And lastly, um, Give an RFP out to replace um, firewalls in all of our schools. This is part of our the last step in our plan to overhaul our technology with our ESSER funds. Um, and so the RFP has a deadline this, this coming Friday. Um, but this is a, another great step um, to sort of complete the overhaul of our technology in our schools and make everything more reliable. What's a firewall, Ren? A firewall is, thank you, Ben. Good question. Um, it is um, it's a device that basically um, connects schools and networks to the internet. Um, and so it blocks bad things from coming in and make sure that the things going out are going to some places. Questions for Ryan? We, we have a We do, we do. yes. But this could be an upgrade? Yeah, it, the, um, the ones that we have now, they're reaching the end of their licensing period. Um, and so this is an opportunity to upgrade um, up in, and to up in them all the same time. Sorry, Russ, about um, uh, enrollment. enrollment. Um, you said we are at the same amount we were at the end of last year after the seniors graduated. No, no, just no with the seniors. It wasn't ending. Wasn't there a concern around that too? Because that that class was a pretty big class, and so we thought enrollment was gonna we were gonna. Think that well, it was going to go down a lot after that class. So the fact that it was a pretty small, it was 65 students. The show oh, which was it the, the, year before before that. Yeah, the year before, before that? Yeah. Yeah. All the years are rolling together. <laughs> yeah, is there a pattern to where they're coming back from? Or no, I mean, it, it was really distributed across the schools. You, you, you'll kind of see, I think, um, if you look at the table, it was, it was distributed across, um, you know, there were two students at um Billington, one student at Reading, um, two students at the middle school high school, one student at West. So it, it, it's really dispersed across. What was our enrollment the year before last that had that big class? I'm just does anyone remember? That's a great question. I think we peaked around like uh, 1060. Is that right? During the height of the pandemic, does that sound right? For who are you talking about? This like when class? we had that big like the class that like that graduated that we're all worried about like how big of a yeah, that was not last year. You're saying it was the year before. How how big of a enrollment was it? I mean, at it was that like, time? wasn't it 80 students that graduated that year? Yeah, so right. 20 more theoretically than about what we have. Now. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Here's a chart. Uh, Adam, I have my real hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> there was no comment on it. It's, it's a bad joke. Um, oh, so I'm looking at the enrollment by town um, spreadsheet. For folks that are come like Rutland Town, are they choosing? They don't have school choice, so how does that work? They're paying out of pocket to come. They do have school choice. They do Rutland, have school Rutland, Rutland Town, Rutland, Rutland, yeah. not Rutland City. Rutland okay, Town. and like, does Rochester have school choice? Yes. Mendon. Yes. 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 Okay. Interesting. And then, like, same with like West Windsor at this point, which lost school choice. There, I believe those students are still grandfathered because it was right. before right. Gotcha. Thank you. Anything else for Brad? All right, thanks, Brad. <clears throat> Shana? Thanks, Brad. 
can I, can I go back to Raf? So sure. call you back. Feel free to stay there. Um, is there a way to um, uh, maybe start? I think I don't want to say this. Moving forward with the new school build, can we have a, a more extended understanding of the enrollment dynamics as we move forward through the financing of the new build and how that changes? Yes, um, I mean, I think the the tricky thing is to remember that, like, even though we've been gaining students, this doesn't impact our like, like the ADM window for financing occurs for that thirty day period um, at the start of the school year. So it, yeah, it's so, so yes, absolutely. Like, like we can look at like how how the enrollment trends have changed over time and sort of what what we're seeing, um, but but it doesn't it, it doesn't impact the funding in the same. Yeah, I, it's more of a, I guess, a, a talking point because that's been a, a point of discussion on whether folks are supporting or not supporting the new build costs is this idea of whether if we build it, we're going to gain enrollment. And I think that would be really help you, helpful for our taxpayers to know that as we move forward. Yep. don't know what that looks like, but I've, as I think about it more, I'll let you know if I can come up with anything. And one thing that Raina and I have done, we, we had this sort of historical document that we produced with the town reports that part of the challenge with enrollment is like, you want to try to have as consistently measured as possible. And so this is one consistent measure that we produce for the town reports that lays it out over a number of years. And you definitely see that COVID bump and the decrease after that. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how that looks moving forward, like a visual as opposed yeah. to the numbers that we yeah. see on a chart. I can put it in the board report. Okay, great, thank you. Hey, Sharon. Hi there. So I'm going to articulate on some of the, the highlights in my list. Um, one of the most exciting ones is that we recently had um, a family move here and two international students from the Ukraine. And typically our English language learning students have been very young and have been very successful immersing in our kindergartens or preschool programs. And we had two high school students and it was a, a new challenge and it was very exciting creating our, I should say our counseling department next door has been setting up tours, matching the students with student ambassadors, issuing translation devices. We have language testing that will be happening and getting lined up intensive English language support services for those students. And we'll also be providing guidance and consultation for all the faculty who have been welcoming them, uh, welcoming them into their classes. So it's really wonderful. And if you, you know, see these people in the community, please say uh, hello. Not included because it's not a licensed educator in the retirement announcements is Benita Burton, a beloved driver, uh, an integral part of the special education team. Uh, she retired recently and she worked for us for many years, drove many, many miles in all kinds of weather to bring our students to school daily. And I have to shout out to Shelly Parker in the central office, who's been getting up at five o'clock in the morning to map out routes, get substitutes, and herself drive students to school every day until we had found a replacement who started this week. Um, I often think of the conversations that we have around this table about how will we know when the work that we're doing is working uh, in terms of literacy and mathematics proficiency rates, because we don't see that reflected in Cognia or SBAC scores. So I was trying to think of a way to answer one of those questions brought up. So I wanted to um, articulate that we have interventionists, special educators, classroom teachers, principals, counselors, who are all meeting on a regular basis to collaborate to plan for success for our students. Now, this is not to say that this was not happening before our language, or rather our literacy and mathematics initiatives and our SEL work, but the increased awareness and the expertise and the level of detail in that collaboration, thanks to our recent initiatives, are creating um, opportunities for our students to be successful and tap into resources in ways that are different and new and more creative. And I wanted to give a shout out to the efforts of those educators in our buildings. I'll also be talking about one more topic, but I'll be partnering with Jen Staten um, during her report for that. You want to um, stay put? Jen can just come. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, chair. Not. <laughs> 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 
Um, so there are two parts to my report, and the second one was just about some of the work I'm engaging in right now that's really federally heavy. So we um, do receive money through the title program, titles one, two, and four. And there's a lot of pre-work that goes into securing those funds. We have to do a comprehensive needs assessment and an improvement plan, and we have to amend budgets from last year and come up with new budgets for next year. And we also have to hand some money to our independent schools. That's part of the work we do. We have to do outreach to them and say, hey, you can access some of this money by federal law. We can manage it for you. How much would you like to access? So there's all kinds of consultation that goes on with that. It's a really interesting process. One thing that um, I wanted to speak to is the fact that our homeless funding has gone up by quite a bit. Um, and I wanted to pull Shana in on that because she manages that a little bit. So I think uh, by Jen's calculations, our typical homeless funding was approximately $500. And this year, it has increased to a need of $9,000. And it could increase a little bit more as well. And there are some you know, good points of information that would be helpful to know about why did it go up so significantly. Our uh, numbers of students who have been without housing over the last several years has tripled. So there's quite an increased need for those students and families. And when we provide support or cover expenses, Jen has a very strict detail for, through the title funding of what we are allowed to contribute to and what we are not. So we're very careful to follow those guidelines. But one thing that's increased in addition to the number of students who are without housing in our community is that students who attend school in a different district but live within our encatchment area of the district, we are also required to cost share the cost of transporting those students to their school. So that has been a significant piece of that cost increase for this year. Uh, we're also fortunate though that principals, counselors, uh, educators in the building have very long lasting and trusting relationships with families. So when they do have these crises, they reach out. We work in partnership with Katie Preston at the AOE. She's the homeless liaison for the state of Vermont to help put families in touch with agencies and resources that they might be able to avail in addition to what our obligation, our federal obligation is. Um, Sam. Um, when you say triple, I mean, has it gone from like one to three or from... It's fewer than 20, currently, and, it, and it fluctuates a little bit because mm -hmm. we don't always find out about it right away. And sometimes the student will go back to the other district, but then they might come back mm -hmm. to us. But if you wanted, I could give you the exact. I wasn't in okay. no, I just was curious. You know, triple can be a lot of yes. numbers. <laughs> um, and uh, you were saying, so you, you were saying that if a student is um, family is experiencing house housing um, and they are homeless. They but if they live within not necessarily the the, the district, but within like a certain amount, of, it, we have to share the costs of the even going to a different school just if they're in this correct if they if the student or students live within our school district that. If you know they could attend our schools, if they attend a different school district, we would still be responsible for cost sharing the transportation, and it's a 50 50 split uh, to get them to that other district. Sometimes that comes in the way of reimbursing for mileage, which isn't an acceptable, you know, gas cards mm -hmm. are acceptable. But I think what, what Sam's asking so when a, when a young an adolescent or teenager or child loses their home. Yeah, it is the belief that the last thing we want to interrupt is their education. Yeah, the community and their yeah. and so they may be able to secure housing a family or friend in our district. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that they can continue with the community they know, and that's right. why we cost share. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Sharon. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We are just trying to flesh that out. Like, so yeah. maybe they, they could be like staying on a couch somewhere, sure. um, mm -hmm. but yeah. they're but they came into our district. They yeah. may be a Rutland kid, and so we're right. helping to share that cost. Okay. Right. Yes. I, um, I have a question. Yeah. Are the the students from Ukraine uh, paying tuition, or did they move into the district? Am I allowed to speak to that? 
No, I don't want to breach any confidentiality. No, no, no. They're, no. They, they live in, a, in, a, okay. in one of the, the towns that tuition to our district. And so that's what's happening. So they do not live within our seven towns, but have choice. And they've chosen to come to our high school. Mm. So they, they do pay tuition. No, the town would pay tuition, Bob. It's not not private tuition. It's public tuition. So it'd be a school choice town like Heartland kids. Okay, so the tuition is paid by the resident town. Correct. Correct. I Got worked it. with Jim Fenn and Raina to make sure that that was all taken care of. Okay, just a and a peripheral idea. If these folks are from Ukraine and they may know other families in Ukraine, it might be a, an opportunity to outreach to get more people to come and join our school. Just a thought. Are you offering housing, Bob? Just, um, just uh, there are possibilities. There you go. <laughs> That's under reporting. I think <laughs> I think he's speaking to a recruiting trip out to Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Go by night. Thank um, you, Bob. Jen, could you uh, tell us a little more about uh, this providing money to independent schools? What are the circumstances for that? So any independent schools that are found within our of the districts of our the boundary of our districts can access Title One, Title Two, and Title Four. So this is federal money that comes through us. We're a pass through. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's not a uh, state education fund office. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we're the fiscal manager house. Okay. Yeah. And then anyone outside of our district that has a student enrolled in our district that meets the parameters of Title I can access our Title I dollars, but none have chosen to do that because it's very low right. amounts of money at this point. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else uh, for our CIA director? <laughs> yes, I have a little, I have one other thing. I have a quote from a teacher I'd like to share. Um, so we've been having some math packed training happening in our district and um, it's been going very well. I have a description of it in my report, um, but Holly Getty from Killington decided to give us a quote. Um, so I, I'm gonna read it if that's okay. Our math pack professional development days have given teachers an opportunity to collaborate with colleagues across the district on common math agreements. Just this last session, I read the math packed book and it said, don't dwell on the past, but now that you know better, do better. This stuck with me as it reminded me of last year's letter tra letters training. As teachers, we are looking forward to learning and implementing best practices to use in our classrooms, both in literacy as well as mathematics. Just last week, Patty Kelly, my fellow elementary teachers and I discussed whether multiplication is just repeated addition. That's how it's been taught in the second grade, second grade curriculum. But that's not always true such as when you're multiplying fractions in later grades. So now that I know better, I can more accurately introduce multi multiplication later this year in unit seven of our investigations curriculum. We also spent time last week debating in-depth forms of concrete, representational, and abstract math thinking. One approach is not better than another, and all three are valuable when introducing new concepts. In fact, flexibility between all three approaches is crucial when developing solid mathematical thinkers. Each math pack PD I leave, I have a clear understanding of our long-term math visions and goals for students as a district, as well as quick changes I can implement in my own classroom the next day. So I thought that was a very nice book to share so you can understand the impact of that training for our teachers and students. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Jim Fenn. Don't have a lot to share. We didn't caught up. I did get caught up in some uh, monthly budget reports and attach those and link those. Um, one of the things that I've done is I've got, had an opportunity to get in and start to analyze some of the activities. And some of the good things that I noticed, for instance, at Woodstock Elementary School, our electricity is running through December 31st at about 25% of what we budgeted. And that's a direct result of the solar panels. Oh, great. At Killington, <laughs> at Killington, through December 31st, we spent less than $6,000 on propane. If we spend three times that much or $18,000 by the end of the year, we're still $15,000 less than we spent last year. That's because of the roof and the heating and the insulation and the other um, things we've done. So, 
as I'm going through this, we're seeing results from a lot of the work that we've been doing to our buildings. And I just wanted to share that because this is the first opportunity we've really had to start comparing from the JCI and from the big project we did at Killington this last summer with the roof and the insulation, everything to see some of the results where we can actually compare them with serial numbers. And I think that's important to share. We're making progress. We're, I'm not sure that that roof and the insulation will ever pay for itself in heat and savings. It will pay for itself in a lot of other ways, but we're making progress. And the JCI um, project is starting to show results. That's great. Thanks. Any questions for Jim? I just, going back to the Ukraine, excuse me, um, do we get the exact same amount of tuition money from choice town students regardless of their educational needs? Yes and no. Okay. Um, for the U Ukraine students, unless they get an IEP that requires some special assistance through special ed, uh, we get the same amount of money for those students as we do for a student that does not have English learning mm -hmm. um, needs. Um, if they're a special ed or they require special services through an IEP, then often we're reimbursed for those costs. But the new waiting algorithm, if they remain with us through next year, mm -hmm. because they are ELL students, they are weighted heavier than non-ELL. So we don't have but a lot they of count English language. Us? In that circumstance, they count, they count, oh, they so count, they count the Weathersfield. Oh, the so, founder of Cal. Yeah, so right. Weathersfield gets, so gets, gets, like gets, well, gets the waiting, not us. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I was wondering yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. That's right. They don't have a husband. They still get this, this, they still raise the money to send the kid here. All right. Can I, before our fabulous student reps, um, Shane reminded me of a shout out that I really wanted to do. Our town clerks, one, thank you all for board members who showed up on Friday evening at five o'clock. That was here, here. amazing, and I so appreciate that. And then to our town clerks, please know they were so available. Raina contacted them that morning, and they all agreed to come in either that night or the next day to repost the warnings. So they really came through for us. We had to have everything, everything reposted by Sunday, and it was because of our town, by you guys all coming in. And then the town clerks doing their due diligence and getting that. I just wanted to make sure Raina asked me to do that. I had almost forgot until thank you, Shana, for reminding me. Thanks to Raina, too. Well, we're doing um, ad hoc recognitions. There are some board thank members you. that didn't hear about these succulents or these cupcakes. Could we get some recognition? Yes, so this is cover? February is board recognition. And mm -hmm. as you might see on our marquee that's been out there for a few days now, this is our opportunity to thank all the board members for all the work you do. People don't realize the amount of volunteer hours, the dedication. It is not just two nights a month. There is so much more. You don't get to go to the transfer station or the grocery store with at least one question coming up. So thank you all. And Rena did a beautiful job of um, some gifts with plants and some sugar. But just for you to know that it's not just this month, but every month we're so appreciative of such a supportive board. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now let's get to the student representatives. Yes. We'll let you guys flip your coin to see who wants to go first. All right. Um, so, yeah, uh, life at the middle school and uh, high school has been um, pretty active lately with the kind of turnover from the first semester to the second semester with a lot of uh, students attending new semester long classes and some students even um, pursuing TA ships, which is teaching <laughs> assistant, and also their own like independent projects to the uh, C3 program that is run by uh, Mr. Bango and Ms. Hazlett. Um, high school students also are starting to look ahead towards SAT testing with a SAT course that um, has started up in the high school. I believe they've already had their first meeting. Um, so students are getting ready for that, which will take place in March. Um, winter athletes continue to perform exceptionally well in their games and competitions and their other matchups. Um, and they are producing a lot of wins against rival opponents, which has been very exciting among the student body. Um, and we wish the best of luck to these students as they enter playoff season. Um, the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council, we uh, continue our work um, as, <laughs> excuse me, um, as we plan for the next year's Leadership Summit. Uh, which was projected to take place in mid-November-ish. Um, we plan to create an executive council 
um, that will oversee the planning of the summit and also Poland um, views and opinions and perspectives from other schools that we will invite um, to the council and to the summit. Uh, and uh, the Code of Conduct Working Group met on Thursday of last week, which was February 1st, um, and that was the second time we met. And we took a look at our the high school, middle school current code of conduct and um, kind of took that apart um, as we plan to reformat the document um, that so that it better articulates the rights, responsibilities, and expectations of students and other members of the school community. Um, and hopefully we plan to do the nit and gritty actual um, reformatting uh, next time we meet, which will uh, date is TBD. Um, Thanks, Dave. Oh. Yeah. Um, I'd say middle school, middle school students, like you said, are doing uh, pretty well as we're getting closer to that postseason part of winter sports. Um, it's also good to see we have like a really diverse amount of core classes at the high school, like um, more, I guess, like curricular classes, but we also have a lot of these half credit electives. Um, so it's it's cool to see that kind of turnover of students, you know, maybe doing something a little more out of the box and, and trying something new. So the new semester uh, means more opportunities for kids to do that. Um, January has been a big month for the arts at the high school. So there's 10 students with their art at um, AVA or AVA Galleries um, High School Exhibition in Lebanon. And I put uh, Rustal in our class, his beautiful photography in the bottom left there. Um, <laughs> And then uh, also they're going to be doing Poetry Out Loud again, which is a national poetry contest, but at the high school, Ms. Perkins coordinates that. So um, I think in Lang, we get a four score of summative if we do that or something. <laughs> uh, so that will be fun to see. It's always kind of cool. Um, and then also the high school and middle school bands both put on their concerts these past few weeks. So um, it's been interesting to see all that. And then also a shout out to our seniors. Uh, I put one in for Tori McNamara, who got um, nominations from all of Vermont's congressional delegation to the US Air Force Academy. Ooh, wow. So she's in the bottom right. Um, AKB, I know he's interested, right? So <laughs> I have my hopes. Um, and also shout out to all the seniors pursuing, you know, whether it be school, work, service, whatever they're going to, as long as they have a, a goal and a passion, something they're looking forward to in the fall, I think they deserve some credit. So. Yeah, that's it for me. Great. Thanks, Ellen. Any questions for our students? Okay, let's move into our time schedule appointment. We have a presentation now from the Woodstock Community Food Shelf. Uh, who, who do we have? Sure. Um, my name is Caroline Shepherd. I, I was the uh, person who established a backpack program for this, this supervisory union. I don't do it by any means alone. I have Noreen Hopewell here, who is also a 27-year veteran classroom teacher, who, like myself at 39 years, was very aware of the fact that there were many children who did not have access to food, who were food insecure, especially over the weekends. And recently, Cindy Long has joined us. She's moved in from New Mexico. In New Mexico, she worked on the food shelf there and even was a purchaser some years for one of the food shelves there. And she's joining us. And he's not here tonight, but Tom Hopewell, Marie's <laughs> husband, jumps in and can bag with us if, he, if we need it. But he usually is the heavy lifter person for us. We um, I'd like to just talk about the history of the program for a minute um, and then and then go into more the specifics. Um, so backpack programs uh, have been going on since 1994 in some parts of the United States. It originated in Arkansas, actually, in 1994. Um, in Vermont, the Vermont Food Bank, Bank established their first program in 2000, October of 2008. And um, after I retired um, in 2013, I approached the, the food shelf board wondering um, with, with the help of some of the board members who had talked with me, if we could establish that in our community. And our first thought was to approach the Vermont Food Bank to see if we could get any support and any help from them. Um, when I spoke with Jennifer Hutchinson 
at the, as she was the um, program person, the contact person, um, she made it clear that at that point that we Woodstock is too affluent to be eligible for the program. Um, so we they have two criteria that they that they rely on. One is at that juncture um, was the number the percentage of students that get free or reduced lunch was or free lunch, and the other was how much funding they had. And so instead, um, another board member, uh, Helen Curtis, was on the board and was interested in helping me. Um, we looked into what made up a backpack program that was offered by the Vermont Food Shelf, and we started looking for ways that we could fund it um, and how we could get started. So um, it was in 2014 that I started talking with that board. And then um, the program required us getting um, support and help from the people in schools that are really aware of the students that are in need. And that was nurses and guidance folks. And then um, administrative assistants just by, by being there sometimes got, were involved. But our first, our first thing to do was to educate the townspeople through the school as to what people could get at the food shelf, what, what was available. And so we circulated flyers throughout the elementary schools. And um, then we started working on how could we approach it here in, in Woodstock. Jennifer Hutchinson's one comment after talking with me about our lack of eligibility was, be sure to start small because you would hate to have families start receiving food and then have to collapse it. And so with that in mind, um, we started um, in 2015 with our first distribution was just to West um, Woodstock Elementary. And at that juncture, we gave um, the guidance care, Erin Blanc was my contact person there. We gave her a box of food um, that allowed her to support 10 families with 24 children. So that was how we, we first got started. And initially we gave them re reusable grocery bags to, for the food to go home with. In. But keep in mind that the program is called a backpack program because it is a program where we hope that every family's right to privacy is maintained, that the food is put into a backpack. Let's say the class is out of the room for PE. Erin knew when that would be and she would put food in the backpack so that there was no stigma attached to it. So um, after, after we got going with the elementary school in 15, in 2016, we started to support the high school. And that, that's handled a bit differently. Originally, the food was going to the guidance office and students were welcome to come in and get food if they needed it. There were a couple of families that first year that were in, there were some serious health issues with the parents. And so food was, was boxed and taken to them, um, one in particular in Reading. So it, it was a few things that were diverse. Coming forward, that program is one where students who come in and haven't had breakfast or in any way need food throughout the day, they can go to the nurse's office at this point and, and get that food. Um, then it was later that year that um, the National Honor Society's advisor spoke with me about them getting involved in the project. And what they did for us is we we shop every month and it's a considerable amount of food that we're doing now. And I'm gonna hand out a, a I'm gonna give you a handout. And if you look at page three, you'll get a sense of the growth. Um, so we purchase, it usually takes a couple of our our couple of big SUV type cars full of food to get it. Uh, to get it purchased. What they were doing is most of our buying is in, in bulk down at BJ's. So they were helping us by breaking down the cases of food and, and given a list, sort it by towns so that we could then transport in bins to the various towns the food that they would need for the next month. 
and that and it and we relied on the um the 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 nurses and guidance and so on to distribute it. Um, that was a huge help. But I want to share a quote that I that just really just made me so aware of what what children don't know or young people these are youth these are probably jun seniors in high school or juniors and one woman one young lady said to me i didn't even know there are people in my town who don't have enough food mm -hmm. to have gotten that far into high school and not be aware of that that it, it really was it, it was i thought it was really amazing that these kids were involved. They were all given um, recognition with for community service and so on. But it, I think it was a really incredible educational piece for them to be involved in that program for us. And then COVID hit. <laughs> um, in the summer of uh, 2016, um, if we go to that juncture, we started to support Summer Soak. So, um, we we were bringing food um initially it was sending home backpacks the the bags of food with families but then it, it expanded into providing snacks and other things throughout the day for the children attending summer soak the month of july so um the only time uh, and, and that happened some during that summer so it happens sometimes during the summer soak is in the summer months, we don't want them to end school mid-June and not be back in school until, you know, just before Labor Day and have no food. Um, so some of us, um, they, we offer the option, they can sign up, which does remove some of the anonymity to it, um, but some of them do request the help through the summer and we deliver food through the, to them through the summer months. Um, so as I mentioned before, we shop once a month. Um, and Noreen Hopewell <laughs> most often is the one that's helping me to, to bring the food. And we feel very fortunate to be in a collaboration with um, the, Our Lady of the Snows. They have allowed us to use their, their, base, their basement space to store the food. Every Thursday, the three of us, plus Tom, if, if needed, get together and we bag the food. And this is where I'd like to give you this handout. If you turn to the third page, um, if you wanna just take one and take one and pass it on, if you get a sense of where we started in 2015 with 10 families and 24 children, and we're looking at 33 families and 75 children that we're supporting now. Um, I, Try putting some cost things into um, give you an idea. One I thought was really interesting is um, in the sum impact data, it says in 2015, that box you remember me talking about, we gave to Aaron Block for 10 families and 24 kids. The monthly expense at that point was $133.63 for those items that you see listed. I calculated what we're paying today, and that same amount of food would be $376.32. So there's a, just a significant um, cost increase. So if you look at 17, 29 families, 47 kids, 18, 61, and, and, and 21, 70, I don't, I don't know why I don't have the, the number of families, and I apologize for that. Last year, 32 families, 75 children. This year, it's 33 families and 75 children that we're meeting the needs of. And then just some, just the budget, the aspects of what it's continued to, to cost. Um, the summer soak is, is in with the elementary expenditures each time. And so this, this, this year right now that we're working and we're look, um, I costed it out for um, the budget at the shelf. We just had to make our budget and we're looking at funding this, they're looking at funding this at to, for $35,000. Um, so we are spending, or we, we have spent for the, this last year, twenty two a little over $22,000. 
And so why do we do this? My last paragraph, essentially, other than to give you a list of the kind of foods we supply is why do we do this? Well, with one in 10 children in Vermont, and I'm gonna read this, I hope that's okay. With one in 10 children in Vermont being food insecure and 29% of the Vermont families participating in SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition As Assistance Program, that includes children, we're sure that the need is greater than what we're, than what we're meeting. Um, though we're careful to make sure students receive food and are, are only known by the school personnel, families hesitate to participate, being concerned that others will know or they're just too proud to ask for or, or, or you know, seek the help. Um, we, as I mentioned before, during the summer, those families that, that express a need for us to continue to support them, we deliver to their homes. Um, so I, I, uh, the, the, the food shelf board just wanted us, for me to make you aware of this, this program that's, that's going on throughout the year. It's not something that stops in the summer for those that, that want it. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about about the program. Carolyn, thank you for coming in this evening. Noreen, Cindy, such important work that you do. Are there questions from board members? Um, thank you all so much. This is, as Ben said, this is such important work. Um, has there been any talk about partnering maybe with Veggie Van Gogh to help get more fresh fruit and veggies out with the packaged food? Noreen, you've done some work. I did, so I, I worked with Veggie Van Gogh in the past to deliver to one of the schools in the district and I would just go that day and pick up for the number of families and deliver it to the school and then the administrative assistant would divide it up amongst the families there but other than that we haven't mm -hmm. worked directly with them mm -hmm. no, we could approach her I, I, I'm assuming Noreen I forgot to mention um, Barnard entered this program a little later than than Wes or Prosper because Noreen was running a similar program herself for the kids at Barnard. So the, the need is there. Those of us that spend time in the classroom, you know, it, it, it you really are aware of how many children um, vacation, just prior to vacation behaviors just go out of sight. Right. They know they're going to be a week to 10 days without adequate amounts of food. Okay. Uh, again, appreciation for all your voluntary and what you're doing. Is there any kind of collective power that um, is possible in terms of partnering? Like you mentioned, the barn and food shelf. There's the Red Reading West Windsor. There's like we want in Bridgewater. I'm so. glad you brought that up. So when we started the program, um, we spoke with about doing everybody right. <laughs> and Reading the reason that we didn't approach Reading seriously to be involved in this particular program is some of it is proximity yeah. but also they have their own food shelf and I spoke with one person there maybe getting them to run a, a program but I don't believe I'm not aware that that's happened yet yeah I but, just I think it's, yeah. it's an invaluable service and I think as you know, one of the barriers for folks is transportation. It is. So it when we have, is. if you look at the numbers that we had for enrollment across the, really around Windsor and Wyndham County, we have folks coming from Stockbridge, from the town, right? Yeah. Um, and that we're really not just kind of a Woodstock-based district. Yeah. So I'm not trying to give you all more work. <laughs> <laughs> You've done enough, but just Yeah. I just want to share well, a chat, like, and I remember reminding Carolyn, the week before COVID really hit, it, we, we closed down schools and we were so concerned. Her and her team showed up at this office with just truckloads of food. And it was amazing. And we started delivering food with the school buses. And I just thanked her so much. They, It was one call and they were in action and moving and organizing. And I will never forget seeing this this. Uh, conference room fill up with food as a result of your team and all the hard work. The, the one last thing I need to say to you all is that we appreciate your thanks. This whole program yes. is totally funded by donations to the Woodstock Community Food Shelf, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. This one program, when it's been at almost $23,000 for one year and it's budgeted now that they'll support through 35. And if, if 35,000 doesn't do it, I bet the money, the money won't be there. It'll, make, it'll be there. And Anne Marie is on the board of the food shelf. That's why we're here. She's the we're, committed, we're committed to this program. It's amazing. Thank, Thank you, you Anne Marie. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.
Should we have a report on our draft strategic plan bill? Can you enable me, Mrs. No. Bishop? Just give your okay, Thank you. Oh, oh, one second. I have to you know, play the yeah, move things around. Come back. All right, you can just gonna make this super 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 and so a group of community members, faculty, students, thank you all. And so thank starting you. last summer, we began thinking about what are the new strategic planning goals um, for our next Battle Town 2024 to 2027. Pretty amazing. So just to review the process, we began in July um, with a visioning session, bringing the leadership team together, bringing in the design team together. Um, our second meeting was in September, where we started looking at our data from across the district, sharing the, the things that we were you know, proud of and the things that we were concerned about. Our third meeting, we began to brainstorm goals and objectives. Um, the writing team in between a smaller group, putting those ideas into concrete form. Meeting four, we were vetting the drafts of the objectives and strategies, and that was mid-December. And then now we're looking at that for you all to look at what are our priority areas, what are our goals, our objectives, our strategies. And then I will be presenting in, please do, mm -hmm. um, April, the full new strategic plan. Oh, no, April is the um, my annual report. So that's the slideshow. So we wrap up the old annual report and then May we'll have the full new brochure as we have this year. And so that's the process we're working on. So the process is first, we were we developed and established what our priority area goals were. We then, once we had our goals defined, we then looked at objectives and how do we meet those goals? And then what were the, are the specific strategies we will put in place um, as we try to accomplish those goals. We knew from the first go around that we put everything in the kitchen sink in there. That strategic plan was huge and had real broad um, work to be done that we continued on during COVID and we still feel like we made some progress. It was pretty exciting. So we try to be much more strategic in our strategic plan and hopefully you'll we'll see that in the goals that we have to meet. So our first priority area is around enhancing educational programming programs and diversifying pathways. So that was a major theme that came out of the design team is making sure that all students had a pathway to their individual success. And so our goal is through a diverse educational program that includes multiple pathways of opportunity, MBSU empowers all students to realize the vision outlined in our portrait of a graduate. So we're looking at students uh, have access to flexible pathways to achieve personal success. How do we articulate those pathways? How do we make sure students know about them? Making sure that there are career opportunities to ensure student agency, that excitement and intentionality for post-secondary planning and to identify and remediate unmet needs or holes. So really we're reflecting on the, the things that we have in place and where do we need more support? Another of the goals is student goals for math and literacy are supported through strategic use of time. And so many of you may remember last June, we had a presentation from New Solutions K-12 and how thoughtful we are about how students' time is used. Um, I remember very clearly every minute counts and we add up those minutes across the school year it really makes a difference on how we think about our students learning. Um, and so we'll make sure that we implement those recommendations around scheduling and then we'll evaluate and adjust mechanisms for teacher feedback around the strategic use of time. So we put these plans in place, we're evolving in terms of our schedules, but really talking with our teacher to see how that's impacting uh, the student experience. 
And then student-centered vision and goals are in place for each content area, including social emotional learning. So over the last five years, we really have used the mechanism of strategic planning in a lot of different ways. And we've seen in our mathematics and our literacy and our over, overall strategic plan, how keeping that focus and really articulating how we move forward is really making sure we're accountable and we all know what direction we're going in. So the thought is how else can we use strategic planning around our social emotional skills so that a program that's in place for pre-K four feeds into a program that's five through six that feeds into a program that's middle school and high school. Thinking of that long-term experience of students. So our hope is, and in terms of meeting the school around programs and diversifying pathways, that we really think about other opportunities for visioning and getting those strategic plans in place. Our next priority area is around vibrant home, school, and community partnerships. This is something we think about all the time and really kind of look for new opportunities. But in order to foster vibrant home, school, and community partnerships, MDSU cultivates trust transparency, and inclusion across our towns and cities. Our first objective is students, families, and educators, and community members feel a sense of belonging in our schools. So we increase opportunities for families to make impactful connections with schools and greater use of data from culture surveys to inform change. Already, the, what we learned in the last uh, Quaglia survey has been something that we think back, we reflect on, uh, we use as a data point. Those will be going out in the next few weeks again. Um, and engage families with MVSU communication to build stronger partnerships in student learning. So we're exploring and implementing uh, opportunities for family partnerships. Our newsletters, that was a new piece from the last strategic plan. We did not have regular newsletters going out from our principals. That's one opportunity to communicate with parents. What are other opportunities without inundating parents with too many pieces of information? So really looking at other ways we can communicate and explore and implement communication strategies for family outreach, thinking about other ways to bring parents into our communities in a way that offers dinner, offers other ways of looking and, and letting them set that agenda. I know that's how we, um, I have a parent advisory council. Often they're bringing agenda items and we're bringing new topics to bear. Um, just shared one with uh, Karen and Ben around just how students enter and exit the high school, middle school campus. That was a real concern from some of our parents. So it's great to bring in parents. How can we do that? And how can we bring more and different parents in? Our third priority area is around a culture of belonging, purpose, and joy. Mm -hmm. So the goal is MVSU creates a culture of belonging, purpose, and joy so that students will own their own learning and be a meaningful and positive voice in their school communities. The objectives and strategies are students will think creatively, work creatively with others, as well as demonstrate courage to explore and implement innovations. So providing students with a variety of meanings, means to communicate their knowledge and understanding beyond the written form. What are other ways that students can demonstrate their knowledge with what's going on? Are we okay? Did I see? Okay, no. we're all here. Um, and continue to emphasize deeper learning practices and opportunities. So that's that physical active engagement in the material and content. Students will be empowered to own their learning and be a meaningful voice and participant in their school communities. So bringing back and create opportunities for students to celebrate their learning. We used to have some really exciting uh, celebrations of learning at the middle school, at our elementary schools, and how do we bring those back post-COVID. Um, investigate and implement a broader range of opportunities to develop student voice and acknowledge student contributions. I think our student board members are a prime example of how bringing student voice to the table is so important, and I'm knowing where else that can happen. Student connections to peers and adults improves the well-being of the school community. So continue to employ and refine our restorative practices. Identify and implement other strategies that will enhance our social emotion learning programs mm -hmm. and offer district wide strategies for teaching healthy risk taking behaviors. I think one opportunity we brought the um, ropes course to Prosper Valley. Many of our schools are using that campus indoor and out as a way of developing those healthy risk taking behaviors. What are some other options? So we want to look into that. And then student engagement increases due to educators having a deeper understanding of the factors that impact student engagement and have provide diverse opportunities for student learning. And so identifying the students who are not fully engaged and offer opportunities for them to realize their potential. And then evaluate needs for professional development systems around student engagement and behavior. Um, we haven't spoken about this. We're in the process of developing an educators institute. 
for the uh, June 19th and 20th, where our faculty will be offering a variety of topics, including engagement, deeper learning, um, uh, uh, AI. And so how do we increase our skill set of our teachers, not just in our district and around, so that we really develop those kinds of professional systems around student engagement? We have a guest. Uh, oops. Uh, area four, safe and supportive school environments. Through the cultivation of safe and supportive school environments, MDSU provides the foundation for students to be fully present for learning and be stewards of their personal wellness. So we will foster a community that allows for conversations and addressing a range of perspectives. So identify opportunities and cultivate experience that will expand students' engagement with a variety of perspectives and increase educators' capacity to engage in media conversations around challenging topics. We want to bring forth all kinds of conversations. We want to make sure our faculty and staff feel confident in facilitating those conversations. We want to establish systems, structures, and resources to support the equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. So we continue towards full implementation of that policy and investigate and implement the structural changes that need to occur to, to sustain our equity work. We had two years of serious work to develop that policy. We need to make sure that all parts, and it's a very deep policy, are fully implemented. And then create safe and healthy learning environments. Advocate for greater community-based SEL resources. We can't be the only show in town. We've got to really access our other designated agencies and make sure they fully support the work we're doing. We have to review our SEL supports and resources to ensure our systems are consistent and coherent. So an experience that a, a child may have in a pre-K-4 then feeds into a really strong 5-6. And so we don't become obstacles to how do we engage in that community. We all know what the expectations are. And students are real aware of those expectations. And they move with them as they move from school to school. Like SEL, Sherry. Social emotional learning, sorry. Okay. Yes. And then provide planning and resources to ensure that all our campuses are healthy and safe school environments. And then finally, priority area five, Foundational systems, coordinate, simplify, and routinize operational systems in each of our buildings across the district so the operations are transparent, transparent, user-friendly, and efficient. So we want to recruit, support, and retain an exemplary faculty and staff. So we identify the practices that help us to recruit the highest quality and most diverse faculty possible, especially in areas of critical shortages. We want to review current mentoring practices and adjust where needed to leverage the strengths of current staff. And we want to create more opportunities to recognize educators who excel in the profession. We're not good at saying thank you and saying you are doing an amazing piece of work and we want to do that in a really public way. So we want to do better at that. We want to assess the current infrastructure and operations with the goal of enhancing systems. So identify financial priorities and create a financial strategic plan. This is Sherry Soapbox. Um, we want to develop and implement onboarding and offboarding procedures for board members and staff. So how people come on board, how they leave, how do we learn from both those experiences. And we want to engage in reflective practices at the classroom, building, and district-wide district levels. And so develop a continuous improvement plan to evaluate the efficacy of implementation of district-wide efforts. So that's kind of the work that you saw that Jen and team presented um, earlier in January. How do we look at those goals and make sure we're moving in the direction? How do we hold ourselves accountable? And then refine process to collect the thoughts and concerns of the school community so they inform change in the district. So it's real dialogue with our communities. And this is our new portrait of a graduate. You'll see instead of academic excellence, it says success. We thought success was more obtainable and more equitable. We'll have mountain views and we'll still have inspired locally. Prepared globally. Prepared globally. <laughs> and that, oh, I thought there was one more slide, but I think nope, that's the final slide. So those are the priority areas, goals, and objectives with our, uh, for our next strategic planner. Thank you, Sherry. That's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot that went into that. I was part of some of those sessions and um, that was a, kind of a crowdsourced sort of a approach to um, you know, determining our direction. Uh, it was interesting uh, to be part of that. Um, I know some others were as well. Any questions for, for Sherry on the strategic plan? Okay. Great. Great. We will, we will put, put it to uh, put it to work. That'll be our our guiding star as we uh, continue our work as a board.
All right, next up, uh, we've got, uh, it's interesting, we've got uh, some retiring board members who've taken the initiative to retire so quickly <laughs> that they are not here this evening. So we'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to uh, speak. Eat their cupcake. Yeah, eat their cupcake. Uh, as is the tradition, we've got the farmhouse powder mugs for them. I'll just go ahead and take those home and put them on my show. <laughs> um, we'll get these to, um, to Marianne and Bryce. Oh, good man. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Why? <laughs> You'll have to have not upset about the first one. I'm <laughs> really shocked by Bryce. <laughs> Bryce is, I think, Bryce our, has been around for a bit. Yeah, our, our uh, yeah, our, our longest serving uh, board member. But Carrie asked me to, um, to let's let's uh, let's start with Marianne. Um, Marianne, as you know, was one of our Woodstock board members who came in, I believe, in February, March time frame, filled an opening. Um, and uh, it was great, uh, the, the contributions that she made in the time that she was here. But uh, Carrie wanted me to say, Marianne, although you have been on the board a relatively short time, I've always appreciated the great questions you pose, as well as your background in education. You will be missed, and thank you. And I wanted to add to that, that I think some of her experience that she brought to the table, those were some challenging times, you know, in, in February, as we all uh, new, but I thought she had some very valuable insights just from her background and really helped us navigate a very challenging time to, I think, help bring our community and our board together. So thank you, Marianne. Uh, and then Bryce, um, Sherry, or excuse me, Carrie says, uh, Bryce, I'll miss your steadiness and ability to look forward with uh, common sense and compassion. You've been a great leader for this board with a willingness to think outside the box. Thank you. And I'm I'm not surprised at all by the kind of collective gasp that we just got um, with, with Bryce leading the board. I wanted to say, if he's watching the owl on this recording, uh, I guess later, uh, I talked about this um, in one of our meetings recently. There's a, a quote from one of, I don't know, one of the kind of great masters of painters who's, who's asked, how do you how do you paint a perfect painting? And he says, well, simple. You just make yourself perfect, and then you paint, right? Mm -hmm. And I think our board, in in some ways, I'm not trying to say that we're you know all that, but we've come so far. Mm -hmm. And um, to just in the culmination of that being the recognition from um, you know the Vermont um, a School Boards Association for the our work during the pandemic and supporting our administration. And Bryce was. I mean, in my opinion, it is the heart of that and the cause of that, the impetus for it, of moving this board from what it was to what it is. And I, just, uh, I think um, for those of us who will, you know, plan to stick around this board for, for a while, give them, we owe them our sincere thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so thank you. Uh, anything else, any other words for the recording from any other uh, board members? I mean, I started with Bryce. We started at the same time. We joined the board at the same time, I, I believe. Um, and uh, he took over as chair very unexpectedly. He was not prepared. he was not expecting that to be the case, and he did it, and he did it with grace. And I think there was some bigger plan in place because uh, he definitely led this board from what was in a very tumultuous. Mm -hmm not great place to where it is now so i'm very i wouldn't still be on the board if he hadn't chaired it when he did same so um i'm sad to see him go because i have a lot of respect for him on this board um, i feel like we're eulogizing him but <laughs> yeah. So he's not here right yeah but the dude's a good soul and like a good example of like what community members should expect for right because yeah. it's not just school board it's how much many hours he puts in working, <coughs> coaching baseball at yeah. multiple levels, even when when his kids aren't involved, putting their both on the partners. So I concur. I feel like so he was, I don't know if this is a, a, a fault or a commendation, but he got me on this board. He was my recruiter mm -hmm. mentor. Um, and I always viewed him during the really dark times when he stepped up again unexpectedly, like the lighthouse of this school board, mm -hmm. and really just the guiding light for what we all wanted to embody in representing our towns and, and bringing the school board forward. So, man, I'm going to miss you, and thanks. <laughs> thanks, everybody. And we'll make sure that Matt, you got oh, it. Matt, Matt. Oh, Matt's out. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, he restored civility and order to the board after a very tumultuous time following Act 46 and school consolidation. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And we'll make sure that these coffee mugs get to their rightful owners. And um, thanks again to Bryce and Arian. 
All right, let's move on. We have an item of business here. Uh, I think this might be the only thing we actually needed a quorum for tonight. We have uh, Jim Fenn to talk about our union arena trust and trustees. Um, recent, recently, our trust funds have been moved from one investment firm to Schwab. And Schwab um, has been asking a lot of questions that we didn't have any answers for. So just to give you a little background, we have two trust funds. We have the Parkland Scholarship Trust, and we have the Union Arena uh, Endowment Fund. And each of them has about four hundred fifty dollars or $500,000 in them. Um, the Parkland Trust is for scholarships for our graduating seniors and the Union Arena. Um, was gifted to the to the Woodstock Union High School in 2001 to be a source for revenue and funding for maintaining the Union Arena. Um, the documentation on the gift is very clear. What's not clear, we have no documentation on, is how you develop trustees to manage it and what their roles are and. Uh, investment goals and all of that. And Schwab is insisting that we have those so they know who um, has the authority to release funds. And so what I've done is I gave you a memo that kind of gives you a highlight of what I just said, but I also wrote the Union Arena Declaration Trust. And what I did is I took the Potwin Trust, which I gave you a copy of, mm -hmm. And I use it as my template because somebody much smarter than I am wrote that, and so it was nice and easy to copy. Um, I pulled out the scholarship parts of it because this is not a scholarship, and I put it in. I established three trustees under the same terms as the Potwin Trust, so that they they look very similar. And um, then what I also did because the last investment objective profile was written in 2014. I gave you an updated investment profile. And so tonight, what I'm asking you to do is to adopt the Declaration of Trust for the Union Arena and um, to adopt the uh, investment objective profile. And I'm happy to explain or go into any of them if you want. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty straightforward and, and, and um, pretty much mimic what I met with the trustees and pretty much mimics what they've been doing. Right. Um, but why don't we um, get a motion and then we can move into discussion if okay. that would be appropriate. Is there a, um, let's start with the declaration of trust. Is there a motion to adopt? I move to adopt. Thank you, Sam. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so discussion, um, if I hear you correctly, Jim, it, you, when Schwab started asking questions about kind of how um, how these funds are supervised, we didn't have a great answer. And this is a, a way of kind of providing more. I couldn't structure. find any documents. And I talked with Brian um, Bontrager, who's been around. He was on the board when this whole took, thing took place on the school board. Mm -hmm. And now as a trustee, and I talked with um, Tom, um, Double was. that guy. <laughs> and, um, and both of them have been around forever. And neither one of them was able to find a document. They know what they do because they kind of follow the rules of the Potwin Trust, but we've got nothing that actually gives them any authority. So what this does is gives them authority. I see. So this governs the their appointment as trustees. Their appointment as trustees, okay. their terms of, as trustees, okay. and what they can or can't do. Yeah. It doesn't change anything as far as the trust is concerned. It's still yours. All the rules are still there that were established when that trust was um, given to the Woodstock Union High School from the River Bend Park at Woodstock, incorporated doing business as Union Arena on March 14th, 2001. Okay. And I'll get, I guess I'll get my thoughts. I uh, read through this, it seems very straightforward. Um, if there are board members who are concerned about, you know, um, you know, maybe this is dense or we kind of it feels like we're going at it pretty fast. I'd say that it's 
having this in place kind of reflects our operational reality, and it's certainly better than nothing, which is what we've got now. So I, if there are concerns about um, any of its contents, I think we could um, potentially you know, handle those by amendment. I don't suspect anybody will probably have any particulars to take up. Elliot. I just have a question. Like historically, so the investment was in a different bank or a different? It wasn't handled by Schwab. We have an investment yeah. firm. Right. That um, I guess the question was why didn't whoever it was why didn't they ask for that or was it just overlooked or was it? I'm I'm going to tell you that bank security has changed. Okay, mm -hmm. we've been with the invest same investment advisors for 20 years. They know us, and so there hasn't been a problem. And what I would do is create a document. I get three signatures, scan them, and send them down, and everybody was happy. Schwab wants electronic signatures. They want verification of the signatures. They've raised the bar on safety and technology and security, and we don't meet that bar anymore because we never did. Mm -hmm. So that's really, this is a reaction to them forcing us to do a better job. So it's hey, probably in one of the attachments, but I don't have them in front of me. Yep. If there was to say be an issue with that building that needed large sum of money for repair, whatever it may be, yeah. or management, is it the school board or is it the trustees or is it a combination of both? Like I just don't know how that whole system is set up. Sure. So I, I guess I kind of am wondering what our role is to the trustees' role, and it's just so we kind of have an idea of like how that not, avenue floats. Not a problem. The money belongs to the school board, to the school district. Yeah. And if that building ceases to exist as a hockey arena or an ice skating arena um, at any point in time, the money is yours to decommission it, to de to tear it down, or to repurpose it. Um, if it maintains and goes forward being operated by the Union Arena group that's running it, then the money is there. The theory is that you will continue to earn money and you will use it for repairs. This board about 18 months ago, so probably before you came on the board, approved several spending projects. Um, one was to pay down some of the solar. Uh, one is a project they're finally getting to this summer, so a year and a half after you approved it. So they have to come to you for approval to withdraw money from these, these funds. And then the trustees really manage the investment and release the funds as needed. Okay, the, the, the trustees, have rights and authority to choose investment tools within what the law allows. They don't have or the right or authority to withdraw from this fund without your permission. Typically, EJ will come and present their budget, mm -hmm. but they have, you know, whatever that endowment earns yep. is really their budget beyond what they raise by events and all that kind and of stuff. And EJ's retired, so it's Gunther now. And, oh, um, wow. And Gunther and I have been working together on this, so we're getting ready for the summer when he's going to do the next project. So in essence, the building is the building school board. The, school. the Union Arena, as a entity within it, is its own trustees. Basically, I'm okay. gathering this. So the, the building is they kind of answer to us as far as the building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. starts too. The building owned, is owned by the school district. We actually pay for insurance on it. Um, Union Arena is really. Oh, a tenant, tenant exactly. You know, exactly. leasing yeah. the building for free to operate a program. Okay, that answers the question. That that was a good way of putting it. That's a good question. Other questions from board members? Discussion? Ray Rice is here, and you appointed him to the trustees at your last meeting. So uh, yeah. he's looking forward to a decision on this. So he knows what his job is. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, all in favor of adopting the declaration of trust for the Union Arena Endowment Trust, say aye. Uh, all opposed. The ayes have it. Motion passes. All right. Let's uh, next one to tee up is the investment objective profile uh, for Union Arena Endowment Fund. Uh, do we have a motion to adopt uh, this document? I'll make a motion. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Josh. Uh, Jim, could you tell us about what the investment objective profile is? The investment uh, profile, objective profile is to give an overall vision of what the purpose of this is, this, this investment is, um, to establish what sort of returns were expected, and then to talk about risk tolerance. Um, you know, are, you know, 
how risk adverse are we in our investments? Uh, how what do they need to do to protect us? In New Hampshire, in a public school, you could only invest in what savings banks could invest in. So you were pretty limited to the scope of what you could invest in. Here, they have a little bit more leeway. And so it then talks about liquid, liquidity needs, um, legal constraints, but it also sets up a structure of how much is cash, how much is stock, and how much is bonds, and an expected overall performance. They should, if you look at a 10-year window, should be averaging not less than 5% earnings on in any given year. Now, we've had years where they had negative earnings, uh, but this year they're probably double digit earnings or 23, they were probably double digit earnings. So we've got to look at a 10 year cycle and they probably are investing in a moderately conservative uh, investment uh, program where they're getting five to seven percent annually. And we haven't had anything like this previously. Uh, we had one written by um, the investment advisors in 2014. Okay. And this really mimics it uh, with minor changes. Uh, there was a reference in the old one to a Vermont law that has been out of existence since 2016. And so I removed the reference to the law that no longer exists, a couple things like that. But I kept the portfolio the same and most of the references the same. So is this profile to replace a previously adopted profile or we never adopted the profile? The board never adopted it. The investment um, advisor with the trustees accepted or the trustees accepted what the investment advisor recommended. Okay. You as a board have never addressed it that okay. I can find. And I guess in your opinion, um, I guess, are these allocations appropriate for the kind of entity that it is? I, I'm trusting that the advisor knows what you're talking about. Yes. Josh. That was going to be my comment. I, I don't really know enough about investing it. I would just suggest asking the yeah. expert at the, whoever's managing our money to tell us what the best option is and take, I wouldn't say take the, take the least amount of risk possible. Like you don't want to gamble it on, you know. Right. When I, when I was at Cardigan, we had a $30 million endowment fund that I was the mechanic or the secretary of. I certainly wasn't the decision maker. Uh, we went into a lot deeper depth on what sort of stocks, what sort of investments. With $450,000, you don't have that type of opportunity. Um, but it sets your risk profile, it sets your goals, and within your risk profile and your goals, it gives them a, a, a narrow scope of what they can use. Okay. So, yeah. Do we have a, as a school have a direction as to what types of things we would want to invest in or not invest in for, you know, in terms of overall? I would suggest that as a school board, you can talk with your three trustees and say, um, we would like to see it in green. We'd like to see it in this. We'd like to see it. And ask them to, um, <clears throat> Work with the, the advisors on that. Um, I don't. I would. I would discourage you from getting into Love the it. weeds on it. But we'll certainly talk to your trustees. Invite them to a meeting. Uh, they're supposed to report to you once a year. So invite them to a meeting and, and have that conversation. All right. Any further discussion on the objective profile? All right. Investment objective profile. All right. All in favor of adopting the investment objective mm -hmm. profile for the Union Arena Endowment Fund? Say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. Now, I guess we do have a little more business. Um, Joe. Joe, we have um, HVAC. This is to approve HVAC upgrades at Renegade Elementary School and Killing Elementary School. And then we're going to say retire. We can just do that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, briefly. So, what I'm looking for is approval from the board uh, to accept some grant money. To do some work at Reading Elementary and quite possibly Killington. Uh, so I just need you guys to say yes to some free money. How much is it? Uh, anywhere between three fifty and six hundred thousand dollars. So moved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What what kind of work you're looking to? Do? So uh, it's indoor air quality improvements. Again, there's that last influx of money here to give us an extension. Uh, Reading is definitely on a plate and killing thing quite possibly would be. We're going to get a grant of 350 towards, I'm sorry, 250 towards Reading 
and uh, if Killington is feasible, another 350 towards Killington. So you need approval for 600 to accept? So I, I would just like approval on both schools. I'm not sure if both will come to fruition, Okay, but we're ready for sure. What's the program, Mr. Federal program? Uh, it's, it, so it's gonna be some extra funding, but it's uh, it came down uh, the last Biden one, which was the infrastructure. Okay. It's it's coming through and it's, oh, well, efficiency for Vermont's handling money, uh, they're doling out the grant money and they're asking for approval from our board. Okay, is there a motion to accept the grant funding Joe has described for the purposes Joe has described? So moved. Uh, Second. Sam, thank you. Any further discussion? All right. Nice. Good job, Joe. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> you <need> more, Pat. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks from heaven. All right, so, uh, and then we've got some retirees. Um, uh, Sherry, did you want to, where are, we, where are we going with our? So first of all, we have a retiree, Tim Brennan, who has been in place for as long and longer than I have, but I asked uh, Jen State to please speak to our friend. This is a hard one. I went through half a box of tissues this morning writing this. Um, I am going to read something because otherwise I'm just going to be blubbering mess on the floor. If you don't mind. Please. Okay. Thanks. If you've ever had the opportunity to visit Tim Brennan's classroom, you've been surrounded by years worth of student adoration. Ceiling tiles have been meticulously painted by students, with permission, of course, to show the beauty of the science they learned from him. There's also a precisely labeled crocheted dissected frog. <laughs> which a student made and gifted to him and must have taken the student hours to make. It's pinned to a little dissection tray and everything. <laughs> it looks real when you walk in there. Um, a student painted a wall with a night sky as a gift to both Tim and future students, allowing them to feel immersed in space when learning astronomy. There was a year when seniors collected a list of Brennan-isms, and these are the clever quips he delivers during class that are just hilarious, and the students typed them up and bound them and gave them to him as a gift. You'll also see photos of Tim in his graduation regalia with his arms around students, and he's just beaming with pride and excitement for their future. The legacy Tim Brennan leaves behind with his well-deserved retirement is held by the thousands of students he taught to think critically and enjoy science over his career. I, along with the science department and other colleagues at the high school, will desperately miss his positive colleagueship, his mentorship, and his friendship. Our school won't be the same without it. Thank you, Tim, for sharing your love and human kindness and love of science with all of us. And congratulations on your retirement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Good. Anything further for Mr. Brennan? Okay, I understand we have uh, Michael Lannon at Barnard Academy. But Melissa, anything? I. Sure to put you on the spot. <laughs> He's not retired. Well, I don't know. He's resigning. Sorry. Resigning. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> And he's, been our, yeah. Yeah, and he's been in our two, three classroom for the last two years. Yes. And has done a nice job of stepping in and helping out and, you know, and, and doing come on classroom, which is never easy. So we thank him for his years of service and wish him best when he moves on to his next adventure. He's had many. Thank you, Sharon. And before, Randy, we ask this from time to time, do we need a motion to accept resignation? Is that a thing? Um, so... We leave Vermont and at will state, so you can't say no. Right. Um, but it is customary to accept the resignation from a licensed educator. There's a theory, and I have no idea if there's any truth to it. There's a theory that if you don't accept it, they can they can withdraw their okay. resignation. I don't know if you accept it. So I don't know if that's true. Linda Lafrette would be more um, knowledgeable well, about that than I would. But better safe than sorry, I guess. Well, is the, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, is there a motion to accept the uh, um, retirement of Tim Brandon and the resignation of Michael Lynn? Josh, the motion. Second, second. Thank you, Ryan. Um, all in favor? Uh, uh, any opposed? I'm right. ordering on May just to give them the chance to decide. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, whatever you decide, the ayes have it. Uh, so, <laughs> um, Mr. Brennan and uh, Mr. Landon, you are retired and resigned. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Let's see. Um, moving into our committee reports, uh, finance committee. I don't think we've got anything to report. Uh, we had our um, our meeting um, on Friday. Thanks again to everybody who were able to make that and um, get that very timely update to the budget um, out, and also the uh, the bond article that was that was um, very important. So thank you, uh, policy committee. Uh, we do not have a committee uh, report. Awesome. Uh, Matt Stout, anything from Billings and Grounds? Uh, we did not meet. Uh, Joe was out of town and he just covered the HVAC upgrade. So nothing here to report. Okay. Negotiations, hiring, and retention. Both of those individuals are not here tonight. Right. Yeah. Gone, gone. So nothing to report. And the working groups, the new bill committee has been busy. <laughs> Okay. Uh, really, you haven't been like, you've had a lot of questions you've been asking. Yeah. <laughs> it's been great. Much gratitude to the committee. Yes. For all the excellent work. Uh, okay. So let's see. We have approval of the minutes of our um, January 8th meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Sam, Anna has a second. Uh, any discussion? There are none. All in favor of approving the minutes from the January 8th, 2024 meeting? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? I just have it. The uh, oh, minutes yeah. are approved. Uh, second public comment. Anybody here? We have two. Rhea Bishop. Oh, so while I thank Sherry for giving me credit um, for what you see before you tonight, um, writing an email is, is, and while you are worth my efforts, Literally, I wrote a few emails. Um, if you're familiar with the Reading Greenhouse um, and Amy Harkins, who is one of the most creative ind individuals that I know, um, I emailed her and showed her a picture and said, hey, I really like this. Can you do this? And she ran with it. And she did an amazing job and um, never even didn't care that it was um, you know, short on time or anything. She just said, I can do this. And she was very creative. They're all a little bit different um, and they are definitely for you to take home with you tonight. And um, Violetta's Creations made the cupcakes and um, she has made some amazing yeah. things for us. So I really hope she, she does. Uh, yeah, she does, she does some good jobs. <laughs> Great, thank you, Rand. Any other public comment? All right, hearing none, let's, um, we have an executive session on the agenda this evening. Do we have a motion to go into executive session to discuss a contractual matter? So we move. Josh, uh, one, I think you're second. Okay, we can kick everybody out. Thank you, Juan. Off to the floor. Thank you, everybody. Are we, are we doing just the one? Yes. yes. Oh, the student matter.